In the last five years, I've noticed animals that are, the, the blood is darker than normal. That to me is an indication that these animals are, are being poisoned. When trees are destroyed, it, it's taken away shelter for animals. If all the trees are cut down, where are these animals going to go? They need the forest for warmth. We know that uh, down south there is uh, huge winds and th that happens because there are no trees down south and uh, we will suffer the same suffer the same way as the people in the south are are suffering from I, I think he is referring to tornadoes. Trees play a role in breaking winds from blowing hard. Trees provide security for us. In places where there are no trees, they, they uh, experience strong winds. Trees provide protection. I, I have I have noticed too in recent years that uh, that the birds, small animals, are their 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 uh, homes are being destroyed too. Um, they're they're lo losing shelter. This way. I 
I, I'm glad to see that the young people in Grassy have decided to blockade because we have to teach white people how to take care of the land. It may seem like we're hurting them, but we are actually helping them understand that nature is important. We are not trying to hurt these people that are logging, but they have to know that what they're doing is wrong. We, we know from, from the past that uh, there's still time to correct this, what's happening, what's happening. Scary, eh? In 1958, I saw three months where we were mercury pollution, and we didn't have to go to my goal scene. We were going to go to my goal scene. We were going to go to my goal scene. In 1958, the mill was dumping, discharging mercury into our waterway. The government kept it silent for many years. It wasn't until they were forced to to reveal what they were doing, that, that they uh, decided to tell everybody that they were d discharging mercury into our waterways. There are very few of us elders left in the community. M many of them have died. Uh, they didn't know that our trees and our water were being contaminated. Many years ago, when you looked at the forest, it, it looked very, it looked very beautiful. It was nice to look at. You can now go into into the land, and all you see are clear cuts that look like lakes. It'll take a hundred years for a for a tree to to grow. Even then, I'm not sure that uh, the trees will ever be the size they are again. You will notice more disease in all living things, in humans, animals, and it's because the trees are being depleted. 
The young people now speak English and it will help us get the message to the logging companies with that communication I, 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 from our young people. I, I think they will get the message. We suffer from diabetes because the bleaches they use to make paper that this is where our sickness of diabetes is coming from White people have suffered from diabetes for, for many years and I believe it's because it's from what they consume. It wasn't until 1968 that the people in Grassi have had diabetes. It wasn't until 1968 that we noticed that uh, people in Grassi were suffering from diabetes. Me, yeah, by Germans, after the two months of Dr. Cook, Cash Nogum, the old Mawag and the North, the guys that was wrong with the book, new text guys came with it. Many years ago, there were huge trees. Not now you look around, uh, the trees are very small and it's caused by pesticide use. I, I like what the youth are doing at the blockade because the uh, logging companies are destroying trees. We will have no wood to heat our homes if they continue destroying the trees. A message should go out to everybody and can be on paper that uh, the message has to go out to everybody that logging has to stop for now. <laughs> Take 
if we take our time if you go too fast on something you, you destroy things with uh, Rodney Castle, a marina operator in uh, Grassy. Uh, what made the community of Grassy Narrows say enough is enough, and what made them set up the clear cut logging road blockade? Well, um, from what I know about it, is the clear cutting kept getting closer and closer to the community. And uh, they've been doing it for quite a while, but uh, further away from the community. And now, lately, they've been talking about. Uh, actually getting right close right across the lake and that from the community itself and going in on the marina road and uh, clear cutting a, a big area over in that area um, and the people just said well it's you know been long enough they've been trying to uh, you know deal with them and you know it's been going on for quite some time now and finally they just said, well, the only way it, we're going to get anywhere is put up a blockade and stop them from, you know, hauling their logs and so forth. It's pretty much, uh, you know, what they came up with and figured, well, might as well shut them down, you know, from hauling the stuff, you know, the logs out and so forth. And just talk about how fish stocks are uh, for the community, uh, what kind of restrictions the Crown has placed on people, or? Yeah, um, now I've uh, helped do uh, surveys for the ministry. Um, I've actually did uh, netting for them, and I've actually did uh, sampling for the ministry uh, more than one year. Um, I've done them in different lakes you know, throughout the area for them. And it was where uh, we'd take fish samples from different size fish and, you know, give the samples to the ministry. And then they would um, have biologists and so forth uh, take the samples and then give us the information back of how healthy the fish were um, and, you know, the mercury level and so forth. But um, I find it that um, the, I think they should have had other people, you know, other biologists that don't work for them, you know, do the tests and the studies because I find it it's where I think they only want to give information what, you know, they want people to know or hear. And the fish here are healthy as far as, um, uh, you know, for growth and stuff like that, I see. But then every now and then you do get the odd one that'll have a real big head and small body and so forth. And then there'll be certain ones, like certain species will be bottom feeders and that. And they say the mercury set is settling to the bottom. And I know the ministry people that we worked with, like they wouldn't keep any big fish or give them away or take them home or anything. They only wanted the small ones and very few. Um, I found that to be strange um, when, you know, if they're dead, you might as well, you know, make use of them or eat them. Why waste things? But I find that they didn't want to take that chance or to eat them. So they must have known something like we didn't know. And they say that you're only supposed to eat so many fish. Um, you know, throughout a period of time. And I don't know, there's quite a few guides. Uh, myself, I've been guiding. I've lived here in Grassy for nine years. I've e I eat fish all the time. Uh, you know, I, I enjoy fishing. I've lived in White Dog where there's, you know, uh, mercury also in, the same, in that system. And I lived there eight years before here, so I've eaten fish, you know, most of my life. And I've had, you know, my hair sample taken and so forth. It come back with, uh, there is, there, I do have a percentage of mercury, I know they said, but it wasn't high enough level. Um, but I don't really know that for sure. It's maybe what they want me to hear. Because, um, you know, I've experienced things that 
I've been going to the doctor now and specialist for three years, and I cough um, often, and it's where I'm not sick or anything. It's been going on for three years, and they can't find out why or what it is. And, like, I don't know. I could be, you know, the, the fish, or it could be just, I've lived in the bush, you know, over half of my life. Um, <clears throat> could be the water or what you know we drink now we take the water right from the lake here like our drinking water comes from here also and you know I I don't know we have that tested and so forth and that comes back like it's good and I don't know if the people not living here want us to believe that everything is good you know but um, or mention the fact that they had trap lines that were in and around the reserve area. That's right. About how much of the area around this reserve, would you say, square miles wise, is trapping grounds for people? Who well, trap. quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. I think it extends well into the area where, where, where we're seeing uh, clear cutting. That's right. That's right. And it, uh, to me, what they could do too is there's, you know, get a hold of like the trappers that are still trapping and so forth. And I think, like, allow them to trap, like, into the so many, you know, mile radius. Give them trap lines right around the community. It's easier for them to get to, you know. Some of these trap lines, they got them, they got them quite far away. Like, I don't know if the people really want them that far away. Yeah, maybe, you know? maybe there's better yield, though. Yes, now that's something to think about, too. Now, I know by them clear-cutting right now, the last few years, I've noticed higher winds, you know, the winds have been incredible. And I think that they're just asking for uh, like more tornadoes and stuff like that to happen. Because when they're taking the trees out, to me, the trees help stop the wind and so forth. And if they're gonna strip it right out, it gives more room for the wind to get going and gusty and stuff. That's why I find it, we're seeing more of these storms and stuff like this last summer, we had uh, 72 mile an hour winds go through. I mean, it ripped up and just snapped trees off and stuff like that. But we've never seen high winds like this ever. Yeah. I mean, it, we were out of power for like three days and stuff like that. But I think it's all because of the, the tree cutting, like they're thinning it out closer and closer. Gives, you know, more of a chance for the wind to build up and to have the strong winds. So I think that's even part of it and, you know, it's, I, like I said, it all to me breaks down to, you know, so many mile radius. Don't yeah. cut. Go cut it elsewhere. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there. You know. Yeah. When when you're talking, uh, it seems it's an interesting similarity between dumping mercury in a river mm -hmm. a long ways away mm -hmm. and forgetting about it. That's right. And clear cutting That's a right. long ways away and assuming that it won't affect the animal That's populations, right. yeah. trapping, yeah. Uh, livelihood of people. Yeah. And, and they're not even clear cutting a long ways away, it's a very close distance. That's right. And another thing really, this don't make sense to me, is they, they went and took the camp away or closed down the camp that belonged to a guy that had it going, Ball Lake Camp. I don't know, a lot of people's heard about that camp. And then they turn around and they offer it to the to Grassy Narrows, you know, to run and to own it and stuff. You know, Grassy actually owns Ball Lake, Grassy Lodge, and the marina. And that's kind of the whole tourist area, and, you know, tourist business in this area. What don't make sense to me is why did they take it away or buy these people out when the mercury was on and close them down and then turn around and give it to the people that live here? To me, that don't make sense either. You know, why wasn't it good then, and why is it good now? Yeah. You know, like it, it, it like that's why I'm saying I'm all going back on the results and stuff. Yeah. People that live here, they don't. <laughs> well, it went murky, to say the least. Yeah, like it's, you know, even like with the tree cutting and stuff, with the uh, they say you replant them, and there's so much soil there and stuff like that, and. I don't know, I don't agree with anything because the ministry are the ones that who you're dealing with and they're the ones that are allowing them to cut and they're the ones that are doing the tests and stuff. 
well, if they can make a dollar at it, I think they're going to go ahead and let it continue on. You know, they're making money at it with the tourists and stuff like that. The fishing, you know, if the fish ain't healthy, they probably figure, well, the guys only come up once a year. You know, they don't need a little enough. mercury poisoning. That, that's right. They don't. It's eat. all neurological, man. Yeah, and they don't. They don't eat um, that much fish, see, in a year. But the people that live here, we do. So we're the ones that are getting affected from it, not the uh, the tourists that are coming up with, you know, the money for the ministry and so forth, or the province. So that's kind of where what I know about it and stuff and the. Uh, you know, they're going to do more tests, they say, throughout every so often. They've got to keep testing the fish and so forth. But I don't know. I, I don't agree to the, the way they do it and who they got doing it. I think somebody else should be in there with them or take some samples too that don't work for the ministry and then see what really comes out of it. See if there is a difference or the similarity. Uh, and what about the other resource thieving, environmental desecrating, destructing, and extracting corporations? Well, it's um, like I still think they should, uh, you know, before they allow any of this to take place, is to, you know, set up meetings, you know, before they do anything with the community, um, you know, because they're actually, it's in their traditional land use area, and, you know, figure things out, you know, before they just go ahead and, like the ministry, uh, you know, agrees on all this stuff and just says, you know, it seems like they're the only people that uh, they need to meet with or agree upon with. But I think they need to, not just them, is to bring in, you know, Grassy Narrows itself. You know, the, the people that, you know, like Joe Fovester and so forth, call them to all these meetings on, you know, anything that's done, you know, into the traditional land use area. So the community's aware of it, and then they got feedback on, you know, if they're going to allow it or not, or what's taking place, or what they want out of it. So I think that's what they should do. Uh, why is it critical and important that your lands not be clear-cut? Well, it's, to me, um, well, the winds have been getting stronger. I find it that, uh, you know, we're going to have tornadoes or... You know, it's to me when they're taking the trees and that out, it gives more room for the winds to build up. There's nothing to break it. And we're going to have a lot more major storms and stuff in this area. You know, like they haven't had, uh, like last summer there was 72 mile an hour winds. We've never had that. You know, we've, we've never had, you know, like major winds that, you know, that much. And now it's all the time we're having high winds and stuff. And I find it, that's a big part of it. Um, you know, uh, leave the trees, leave some, you know, some there for windbreaks and stuff. But um, now the way they're stripping it out and stuff, it's, we're going to have some, I think we're going to see more and more high winds and storms, tornadoes and stuff do more damage that we've never had before. So that's pretty much what I see. What kind of uh, efforts have uh, have been put in place to curb the uh, mercury contamination from the mill? Well, I don't think any. <laughs> you know, they just they're just waiting. It's just a time thing. They just think, like I said, it's going to settle to the bottom. They haven't they haven't done anything. You know, to that I know of, not in this area anyway, that I've ever seen. In that, it's they're just hoping that it washes through the system washes somewhere else or you know just goes on and on and on until it peters out or like I said settles at the bottom there hasn't been nothing that I know of or seen so. we've been dealing with the government for the last 40 years in terms of uh, particularly uh, with relocations the hydro flooding a lot of things that have impacted on our way of land a way of life in the land itself. Uh, we've been cut off from from our self-sufficiency. We've uh, we were ending up to a near cultural genocide. So, and these have been as a result of uh, all provincial, like Ontario government policies, of uh, that has happened, 
and we've gone through a lot of mediation, we've gone through a lot of uh, uh, agreements with the Ontario government, but none of these were ever fulfilled, uh, and all that we faced were lies and deceptions from the governments, and, and finally got to a point where this is practically we this is our now our last stand uh, as we took uh, as we took to to the root block and when it came up I think this is a time where the people have said you know we've had enough and uh, we have nothing to lose but everything to gain um, so uh, tell me, what have you? Uh, who, so tell me a bit about who you are and uh, what you've done in the past for the struggle for indigenous sovereignty and protection of your traditional territories and culture. Well, when you think about sovereignty, I think that's that's basically the position that we've taken, you know, for the last hundred years, and it's although the the two levels of governments have never recognized us to to have that, not under their terms anyway, but in terms of our uh, treaties, uh, we have struggled. We've, we live in almost like an apartheid that we've, uh, we are people that are uh, being segregated from all, from all the wealth of this country and things that mean a life to everybody. In, in in Canada, and we've been put in this um, place of call reservation, which is a forced kind of living conditions that we have had to, and and we have no access to uh, to any land whatsoever. So it's been a struggle, I guess, throughout all this time that we've. Uh, We've tried to maintain our place in this country as more or less we still maintain the belief that we are, we are the landowners of this country, we are the, uh, the first people of this country, and everybody else is, is <coughs> has just uh, uh, arrived from another, uh, from another country to make his place here. And we've been trying to establish that relationship with them, but at that has not uh, been the way they want to perceive the, uh, the thing. And uh, so for me, uh, I can remember my struggles began ever since I can remember, you know, through residential school and we went through the, um, the relocation. Now, uh, you know, uh, being deprived, you know, of uh, everything else, you know, what what makes life in this country. And what about, uh, uh, what? so uh, what are your future plans for attacking the problems created by the ill-intended, ill-imposed plans of Abitubi? I'm, I'm a person that exists on hope and if people were to ask me whether I'm, uh, I'm an optimist or pessimist, uh, I, I say I'm, I'm neither. Uh, if I was to tell you 30 years ago that the apartheid was going to be dismantled in South Africa and Nelson Mandela would be released from prison and become the president of South Africa, people would have said that I would be nuts. Or the Iron Curtain, or the walls of Berlin would have came down so people would be free from communism. And Russians would one day believe in democracy. So I think, you know, one place that has to be, that ha justice has to prevail, is in this country, and this is the only place that still remains to be changed. And, I'm, and if I can say it's going to change, 
if only people can see that, and that's the, and that's the message we're trying to say to the rest of the, con the nations. Hey, you know, everybody, everywhere else is changing. Democracy is being, is being given. Justice is prevailing. But what about Canada with the Aboriginal people? It's you know? true. Um, and what about the resource thieving, environmental desecrating, destructing, and extraction corporations? The others. <coughs> well, you know, th there is. There is uh, a lot of people that are concerned with the global warming and everything else that in, in that's happening in Canada. Canada has been ranked to be the, uh, you know, the fifth largest polluter in the world. You know, our corporations are first. They can, they have no limits whatsoever to. Uh, uh, you know, to extract from the land. Uh, they're given management uh, legislation by the governments and the license even to throw their garbage and their, their chemicals into our rivers and lands. Because uh, when I see that happening, then our environmental laws are very weak. They're deceiving. They're not working. They're not being enforced. They're taking a, a backseat to everything that we have to do within the land. And it's only the First Nations that are really, truly impacted as a result of all this, because we are the people of the environment. We live off the land. Um, our self-sufficiency is based on everything on the land, from food gathering, harvesting, fishing, trapping, and <coughs> With all that, if they can appreciate that there is a, ex a society that one, once ex existed without, you know, leaving garbage all over the land, wherever they lived, we lived in harmony of nature, and we lived it well. And if the rest of this society in this country can't appreciate, then there, is, then there is something fundamentally wrong. And I say this because, too, uh, you know, the environmental laws are very, very weak. Uh, for instance, you have companies who have, who have today, besides spilling all the 50 tons of mercury into the river system, were often faced with un environmental racism. In 1998, <coughs> five, eight ounces of mercury was spilled in a high school, in Thomas Aquinas High School in Kenora. And as a result, the government, both levels of government, brought in all the scientists from all, both Canada and the United States um, and environmentalists to do an environmental cleanup. Now, when 50 tons of mercury was spilled into Indian land, into our river system, they didn't do anything. They still haven't done anything to this day. Now, even if they did give any compensation, which they dig down deep in their, their pockets and to tell us, here, you have no more mercury problem. You know, that, that is, that is a, a you know, the worst thing that, you know, that you can tell somebody, it's like demeaning that individual, that telling that person that you don't mean anything. Even this year, uh, Abitibi has violated 30 environmental laws, everything from oil spills, you know, cutting too close to the lakes, over-harvesting, and all they did was get a slap in the hands. They, they got <coughs> the fines that they were given were, you know, was nothing to them. And here, they they still were granted a license. Were were granted to uh, to even much more greater responsibility. Where they 
the government has announced now they're going to control the environmental assessment laws on the for on the forestry sustainable under the Forest Sustainable Act. But on the other hand, you know, you have squeegee boys in Toronto who are doing prison time, federal prison time, for just being squeegee boys. To me, that doesn't make any sense. Like, Yeah, and those are white people, and with the record of the justice system in Canada, there's an obvious injustice, so... I mean, what's what's scru what's a little squeegeeing? <laughs> yeah, and that's what I mean. It's like we, if I broke the laws of any fishing laws, if I broke any license that I'm granted, whether it's trapping, or if I done overfishing, if I done over harvesting, I'd lose that license. But companies don't, you know. No matter what they do, it, like it, you know. That's this is what I mean, you know. The uh, They'll, they'll do anything to destroy the land, that the land doesn't mean anything. <coughs> it's, it's the profits that come first in their own thinking. And before anything can, can, be, uh, can be compromised, and I think, you know, the, the economist has to start talking with the biologist. And good biology and good economists would balance, you know, everything in below. So there is, there is enough money to uh, to make a living today, and everybody has plenty of wood, and there would also be plenty of stuff for the future generation. And I think that's the way they have to look at. But the way it is right now, it's the uh, it's the multinational corporation policy that is dictating the very lives of every people. You know, as I see. It, even in the traditional se setting here, that where we live, and and that is a crime. Uh, the Ontario <coughs> Ministry of Natural Resources, the Department of Indian Affairs and Northern Development, <coughs> the federal and provincial newcomer governments, their roles in the whole picture. You see <coughs> the or the federal government. Well. The federal government, whatever. Take it as an open-ended question. Yeah, the federal government, like Indian Affairs, takes the position uh, that they've uh, that the, that they have uh, transferred the authority to the provinces to control and manage land and resources, and they perceive themselves as they have no jurisdiction, never m mind alone to. Uh, to take fiduciary responsibility, which they have with Aboriginal people, that is, that has been thrown out of the window. Now, when you talk about the Ontario government, anything that has to do in terms of land and resources under Minister of Natural Resources, I mean, that's a pure joke. You know, that ministry is a pure joke because they're supposed to be a conservationist, preservationist uh, of the land and resources, but they're well, you know, uh, in bed with the Abitibi. That's what's happening here. They, you know, they, they, will, they will develop plans that fits only the needs of Abitibi, not to the people. They will say to the Ontarians, but, <coughs> but Ontarians are being... Uh, you know, they, they're fed with propaganda, especially the people in Toronto, where they're telling them that the forest in northern Ontario is well, fine, and dandy, everything is intact, you know, the, you know, Ontario years to discovery, you know, and, but that's not the way it is, because we live here, we see what's going on, we, so, we see how the policy has done to the land, the animals, the trees, the water, everything. It's, it's in complete crisis. So, but Ontario doesn't have to take the position, you know, with First, Nation, First Nations, because in their own minds, they feel they, they don't have to, uh, they, they have no jurisdiction with First Nations people. They don't have to develop policies that fit, 
you know, the lives of Aboriginal pe people. All they can do in their own pr little games is to consult, but it's it's consulting them. It's like telling you, tomorrow we're going to shoot you down. Whether you like it or not, it's still going to happen. That's mainly what they're saying. You got any last words to say? It's just like being a guy who's, uh, who's about to be hanged to see whether you had any last words. That's, that's a kind of consultation that um, the Ontario government is resorting. And that's been sort of the thing that we're being tossed around like a hot potato. On the one hand, one denies jurisdiction, one enforces the law. There's a lot of inextricities in there. Um, tell us how the uh, PayPal Treaty, the uh, only real document, or arguably the only real document uh, that's been signed between uh, Grassy and the Crown. Um, <coughs> you tell us a little bit about the history of it? Well, one of the things that the uh, the the PayPal Treaty seems to be attractable to to our people because it's it's written in a simple language the way one would understand a treaty is written. Uh, the way those people in them days would be able to at least uh, who are not educated. Now, if you look at the original treaty document that was signed, you notice that. All the, you know, every, every chief, like Sagachiwi, was a signatory for our treaty in Grassi. He just put an X in there. So in, when you imagine in your own mind, you know, how much capability was there for those people even to write their names at that time, was something that they, you know, they would... Uh, <coughs> they like they weren't able to read anything, for you know it's that's why the, the, the X's were only put down as a, as a signature to the treaty. Now, when you look at the two treaty documents, the one that we that the government seems to uh, emphasize more as the true document, and the PayPal treaty, the PayPal treaty sort of is is written more similarly. You can say whether one one of them must have been a draft that was originally agreed upon uh, as the working document, you know, to uh, then a doc then another document would would be written that would be written in the terms of the leg you know the the legality of it, but. You know, the thing that always strikes me is the government, Ontario government is saying is that, well, you people surrendered your land. You know, you know who in a right mind would, would surrender a land, you know, that's, that's something that was given to him, you know, uh, just to surrender. I mean, w w there was no war that was going on. There might have been a lot of intimidation, but there was no war. This treaty was signed on the basis of peace, so two nations can live side by side in peace without disrupting each other, without mo being, you know, one being molested. It, w it was based on trust, and, and it was based on s something that would... Uh, that would be, uh, <coughs> you know, so two nations can live together uh, with respect and with a lot of hope. Now, when you think about when you think about these things, the surrender, even in an international treaty, in the treaties that were written international, you know, United States bombed Japan, some, you know, after 1945. And Japan surrendered. Yet Japan is a sovereign nation. They're self-sufficient. You know, when you look from those two perspectives, how can one surrendered have more freedom and, 
And, you know, if we did surrender, why, why don't they have the same relationship with us as they did in Japan? I mean, we, like, they became the, uh, you know, the strongest ec people, you know, as far as economic was concerned. But, but to me, I don't understand. I don't know the understand of their interpretation. That, but there's always one thing that really struck me, though, is like, you know, history tells us that the first French Frenchman that came to this land, when he looked at the, the people in this land, the Anishinaabe, the Aboriginal people, he, he went back to report it to the Queen in England, Queen Victoria, and said, yeah, there's people that are so free there. You know, they got no boundaries. Everybody has freedom. They're, the, they're Indianas, is what they call them. Indianas meaning uh, children of God. They're peaceful people. They have no gates. They have no fences. And Columbus then t says that he knelt down before before, because he was the, the explorer and the servant of the queen. He said, you want me to go behind us? And the queen <coughs> took the Columbus sword and he put it on top of his, his head and body as he was kneeling down before him. And he said something in Spanish which said, go and divide and conquer. You know, I mean, <laughs> we see the symbols of liberty here, the statue, the, uh, you know, the, the, the each people have come up here to start a new life, to get away from monarchies, dictatorships, from, from cr crown ownerships, you know. Uh, they don't like this monarchy system. They don't like the dictators. They don't like the communism. They came here t to be free, the land of the free. But why are they suppressing us? Why are they bringing something, you know, from another country that suppressed them to suppress us? Because that's what the Ontario government always says. This is crown land. This is crown this. But you know darn well they hate the crown. So that's why we have this feeling. This yeah, is when you a really stolen. start talking law. <laughs> yeah, this is a stolen land. You know, they're stealing everything, and they're using what's suppressed and what's what's happened to them. They've learned very well how to dominate one society is by bringing a disease, which you know, that was inflicted on them while while they were in their own country, and. Everyone pledges loyalty to one thing. The governments, they pledge their loyalty to the Crown. The people, the Canadian people, the American people, they pledge loyalty to the flag. Anishinaabe, Aboriginal people, they pledge their loyalty to the Creator. Who was here first and who is going to be here after? Every day we see people burning flags, you know. That's not loyalty, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's telling times. Mm -hmm. um. I'm going to tell you a story, and you know that it's true. Way back in November, JB and Judy came to school, started talking about the government doing things that weren't right. They tried telling him for years, they said it was time to stand up and fight. They said, come and walk with us, and together we'll stand for the M&R at the corporation. Take over this land, yeah, there's...